question. Now, Mr. Bhattar is an immigrant of Pakistani descent from the United Kingdom and the youngest of four children. He grew up in the Midwest and first came to the Bay Area in 2000 to study law at Stanford. While a student at Stanford Law School, he served as the executive editor of the Stanford Environmental Law Journal. And while at Stanford, he also spearheaded a campaign to pr promote sustainable building practices by the university, a day of action to shut down a Lockheed Martin facility, and a student strike against the war in Iraq. And how you got a law degree, we don't know, but you did all that and got a law degree. And then he moved to Washington to work for a San Francisco-based law firm, and his work there included litigation, championing the right to marry the partner of one's choice, and know that this is nearly 10 years before the democratic establishment finally embraced marriage equality. His work has also advanced immigrant rights, campaign finance reform, government transparency, international human rights, and police accountability. Outside of his work as an advocate and organizer, Shahid performs as a DJ, MC, and poet. And the last thing I would like to note is that he has been endorsed by no other than Mr. Cornell West, who was just here last week, amongst many, many other more inspiring figures. I mean, equally inspiring, but many, many more figures. And with like that, with that, I'd like to invite Shahid to please come and take the stage. Thank you so much. That's to say, it's a very gracious introduction and to all of you for being here, to the Department of Sociology for hosting the colloquium and to each of the figures who we're going to be studying today. We're going to be covering a lot of ground over the next 45 minutes or so. And I'm going to be eager to invite your questions as well. Some of the things we're going to touch on just by way of highlights, we'll talk about the last progressive Republican president. We'll talk about some of the longstanding precursors to the current crisis in Ukraine going back 70 years. We're going to talk about connections between world wars and assaults on our communities. And we're going to connect all that to the climate crisis. You go down for that? All right. So, yeah, I'm Shahid. There's a website. You can learn more about me at shahid.fyi or follow us online. Shahid for change. We can go to the next slide. Thanks, Dr. Faye. This is a bit of just a roadmap. We're not going to dive into any of this at the moment. I just want you to see where we're going. So, Militarism, racism, and capitalism were linked by a historic figure who we're going to dive into in about five or ten minutes. They, the different uh, components of these different crises combine to form a whole that is worse than the sum of its parts, and they culminate in existential risks that today are threatening not just our communities, not just our country, but our entire species across the planet. And we're going to, again, unpack some of this as we go. So that's just a sort of like flash of a road sign, okay? So we can go forward from there, okay? So is anybody familiar with Dwight Eisenhower? Anybody studied him in any of your classes? Interesting, pivotal, I dare say, U.S. president. So he is widely remembered as the last progressive Republican. His legacy, you might think the greatest part of it would be leading the Supreme, as the Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied forces, the victorious forces in the Second World War, beating the Nazis, you might think, would be his greatest contribution to civilization. And it is kind of hard to beat that, right? And his very last act, after having been the Supreme Allied commander of the, in the Second World War, after having been a two-term president, after building the interstate highway system, establishing the National Aerospace and Aeronautics Administration, Dwight Eisenhower gives this speech January 17th, 61, I think, and it is the most prescient forecast of a future of a political figure that at least I can think of in modern contemporary political history. He basically warns us to fear what he created. Okay. So this is just a bit of an excerpt from this speech. He gives, I encourage you to check it out online. Now the sort of, uh, vocal intonations of the era, you'll see, you know, his, his mannerism and inflection will be very obviously of a different era. But if you just key in on his words, they are powerful and they are poignant. And this is a particular excerpt from it. So he says that we can no longer risk the emergency improvisation of national defense, right? This is in the wake of the Second World War when we have this huge industrial mobilization 
to fight and beat the Nazis. He says, we have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. This conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry, military industry, is new at that point in the American experience. This is where it starts getting freakishly profound. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, he says, this military commander president, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government, our toil, resources, and livelihood are involved, so is the very structure of our society. This is the part that gets super actionable. We're gonna be tracing a way in which this warning that he gave us 60 years ago came to fruition from Bayview Hunters Point to Jerusalem. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, President Eisenhower says, whether sought or unsought, this is where the term is coined, the military industrial complex. In his first versions of the speech, actually describes the military industrial congressional complex. We'll come back to that connection a little bit later. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted, he says. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that liberty and security may prosper together. The reference to knowledgeable and alert citizenry that is, in a nutshell, why I'm grateful for the chance to be here with you to help share some of this history, which I fear are many of our institutions, from our media landscape to our educational institutions, don't do a good enough job about highlighting. Think about what we're going to describe in the next half hour or so as a deep dive into the intersection of history, sociology, and civics, with a bunch of political implications for today and the future. Okay, so we... This is the part I just want to draw out from his speech, the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power. We'll get back to examine some ways in which misplaced power unfortunately revealed itself in the ensuing years. So is anybody here familiar with Co-Intel Pro? Is that an amalgam that anyone is familiar with? I see one nodding head, just one. Okay, I'm glad we're here. So Co-Intel Pro is an amalgam for the counterintelligence programs. These were run in the United States, across the United States for half a century. These programs were investigated by the U.S. Senate in 1976, the House II. This is worth the story. There's a documentary, 1971 is the title of the documentary. I'd encourage you to check it out. It, it explains how a bunch of hippies broke into an FBI office during the Ali Frazier fight, stole a bunch of files out of a filing cabinet, and took them to Washington, which is the only way we know about any of this. And what they revealed was 50 years of the FBI and the CIA and the Defense Department infiltrating peaceful organizations protected by the First Amendment, pursuing objectives from civil rights to black power, the end of the war in Vietnam to Puerto Rican independence, equal rights for women, Native American rights. And the Senate described it in 1976. I'll, I'll read into it. And this is a three book investigation. They compiled 20,000 pages of records. And, and what they found, the Senate said that many of the techniques used in the COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program, would be intolerable in a democratic society, even if the targets had been involved in violent activity. But COINTELPRO went far beyond that. The Bureau conducted a sophisticated vigilante operation aimed squarely at preventing the exercise of First Amendment rights of speech and association on the theory that preventing the growth of dangerous groups and the propagation of dangerous ideas would protect national security and deter violence. Has anybody, does this remind you of anything? <laughs> Maybe like DHS goon squads being deployed in Kenosha and Portland to suppress peaceful dissent against the paramilitary assassination of our neighbors. We're going to link all these things together because these are not confined to our communities and these patterns, unfortunately, have a deeper root than you might think. So COINTELPRO included everything from uh, infiltrating peaceful organizations protected by the First Amendment. There were undercover FBI agents and informants that were marrying people under false pretenses. I mean, some like, seriously ethically troubling things were going on in this era. We're going to talk in the context of surveillance enabling blackmail in a minute about one of the COINTELPRO's most prolific targets. Before we get there, any guesses as to the national hero we're about to examine? Mm 
and the experience you might have endured at the hands of the FBI. Celebrated a national holiday that was about two months ago. He's got his own acronym. Okay. Yes, right on. Okay, here we go. So, all right. So, Dr. Martin Luther King is remembered for a great many things, uh, many of which you know are absolutely absolutely worth remembering. But much of his experience is papered over and forgotten. He was not just an inspiring visionary leader, uh, but and he wasn't just standing for civil rights. When he was assassinated, he was part of a worker strike, and he had come out quite forcefully against the war in Vietnam. This was a figure whose uh, legacy included a forceful articulation of political moderation. He, if you haven't read it before, has everybody read the letter from Birmingham jail? Has anybody not? If you haven't before, I highly recommend it. 10 minute read, it's profound. And it's very, very relevant to today's political discourse. It might be the most relevant text in US politics at this point. Um, and, and, and just to try to, I can't do it justice this succinctly, but one of the key reflections he offers is the distinction between order and justice and the commitment to order that often undermines justice by compelling a deference to an unjust landscape. And, and that, you know, it is a very long story short, kind of the history of civilization. Uh, and I want to get in the next slide to Dr. King's vision of three intersecting evils. He articulated this just a year before he was taken from us. So the three intersecting evils are racism, capitalism, and militarism. We're going to walk through a couple of case studies to examine how those principles relate, how they not only intersect, but reinforce and entrench one another. And I would invite you going forward as you look at everything from police violence issues in our communities to international relations and war and peace, consider the ways that these factors drive both the exposure of information, the suppression of information, and the promotion of some perspectives and the suppression of others. So let's look at a few case studies. First, Brazil under its uh, current leader, Bolsonaro. So racism, capitalism, and militarism are all reflected quite clearly in the combination of indigenous genocide, the ecocide that is underway in the Amazon, particularly to queer space for ranching. And the militarism is interesting. You might think, you know, we would look at the militarism of Brazil itself, and that might be fair. I'm hard pressed not to observe the militarism in the United States that enables them to come to power. There's been at least one CIA sponsored coup in that country many decades ago, not that many decades ago. There may have been another one in the last few years. And the, well, we'll get back to this in a minute. I don't want to dive too hard yet on who is, which bodies in our government are available to hold which institutions accountable. We'll, we'll come back to that. So that's just one example of how these intersecting evils are intersecting as we speak in a current ongoing time slice in a way that's particularly with the context of the deforestation in the Amazon. There are global consequences with that. And every year that California burns, you frankly breathe it. You can go, and I want to bring that back to the CIA's complicity, right? Because it's not as if that would be happening absent our own military industrial complex, as Eisenhower coined the term, run them off. Other side of the world, similar situation. Indonesia, like Brazil, is the site of a uh, large portion of the remaining rainforests on our planet. There is uh, the, the indigenous population of Indonesia is somewhere around 40 million people, and there's massive displacement being driven by. If in Brazil it's around ranching, in Indonesia it's about palm oil, but the similar deforestation, grazing, burning, uh, frankly, ecologically priceless rainforests to create opportunities for ultimately corporate resource extraction, that pattern matches precisely as does that of the CIA. Now, the coup in Indonesia in 58 failed, whereas the one in Brazil around the same time succeeded. There hasn't been a contemporary resurgence of that history in Indonesia. Just, you know, the, the history forks a little bit, but the point here, the pattern of intervention to enable corporate resource extraction to the detriment of the planet. I want you to map that to Ike's forecast of a military industrial complex. Does anybody want to take a guess at the name of the company that was most frequently at the center of the CIA's coups across Latin America between the 60s and the, between the 50s, let's say, and the 70s? It's not an oil company, yeah. Yes, say it louder. 
the United Fruit Company, which later rebranded as Chiquita Banana to try to get away from the PR disaster of having brought down multiple democratic governments. We were literally toppling governments to steal their fruit. And this went on for decades. At the same time that the FBI was infiltrating civil rights groups. This is what Eisenhower warned us about. And this is what it looked like at that time. So thank you. Now let's fast forward to the contemporary present and bring the lens here at home. How do racism, militarism, and capitalism intersect when we look at the case of domestic paramilitarized policing? Now, the racism you can see, particularly when we examine profiling, one of the interesting challenges from a policy standpoint, there's been a two decade fight in Congress over whether or not to require police departments to collect the data about racial impact so that advocates can ascertain with empirical specificity that profiling is happening or not. Think of it this way, we can collect incidents of racial profiling, that's like the numerator, but if you want to know the denominator, how many stops are happening total, what are the racial impacts of them, who's poised to do it if not the police themselves, but police don't collect that data and they certainly don't disclose it and a bill to require them to disclose it was proposed in Congress in 2001, and it has yet to pass. 21 years ago, there was a debate that started over whether or not to force police just to let the public know what are the racial impacts of stops, arrests, uses of force, charging decisions. And we are still having that debate today after the Mike Brown uprising, after the George Floyd uprising. The Breonna Taylor uprising, after the deaths of everybody from Alex Nieto to Sean Walter Rosa, here, Mario Woods, Oscar Grant, you know, the Bay Area is part of this continuing history of the patterns and practices, racism embodied. Are people familiar with the origins of policing in the United States and sort of how they emerged ultimately from slave patrols? We, that there is this, uh, in some corners, this myth that police are somehow intrinsic to society when it's certainly not been true in the long arc of our country. But it, it's, it, it's particularly, the racism of policing is somewhat baked into the sauce is the point I'm making here, but you can see it particularly in profile because it's obscured by official practice. The capitalism inherent in policing, it can be easy to overlook, but let's just unpack some of this. Cash bail, is the principle that basically allows defendants who are detained and charged with crimes with money to escape short-term consequences and those without it to basically be forced into jail sentences without adjudication. When you can't make cash bail, even without a neutral arbiter deciding your guilt or innocence, you are basically by default detained. And that is the reality for a great many hundreds of thousands of people in this country are in pretrial detention as we speak. Here in San Francisco, our DA, who's frankly taken a lot of political heat for it, was a national leader in ending cash bail and ending the economic discrimination implicit in the justice system being used as a lever for debt collection, essentially. That's sort of what the court fees bullet point refers to. Police militarization is a cash cow, not just for the companies that supply military gear to the police departments, but often for police unions as well. The militarization often entails staffing increases. There's a, a lot of players making money off of this pattern. And I should have put that last bullet under racism. I'm not sure why it's there, but so the 13th Amendment, are people familiar with the, the proviso of the 13th Amendment? It ended slavery except as a condition of punishment. So when we talk about well, I think I should, we're going to get to this now. Oh, it's right here. When we talk about contemporary mass incarceration, it is critical to recognize it as an extension historically of industrial forced servitude. Much of the manufacturing, I mean, a disproportionate amount of the manufacturing that is left in the United States after it was hollowed out in the corporate outsourcing wave of the 80s is prison labor. It's a lot of what we make in this country is produced by slave labor in prisons. And it relates to racism in an interesting way, because if you were to contrast contemporary legal slavery in the United States with its antebellum precursor, you might notice that today slavery is happily multiracial. I don't know what you might want to say about that. Okay, so you can 
Let's go forward from there. Okay, so COINTELPRO 2.0, we're just, again, reflecting on different examples of Eisenhower's warnings to the military industrial complex revealing itself. And note, just before we go on, have you ever heard any of these moments and dots in a mosaic connected? This is the role of analysis. This is why your scholarship is so important because the role of scholars in at any point in history, particularly at times like this of crisis, is to connect dots between the seemingly disparate data point without which you know, people are very easily led into any number of directions. Okay, so this year, the Supreme Court held, uh, heard a case, Bazaga versus United States, which addresses the state secrets doctrine. This was a judicial doctrine uh, created by the Supreme Court in the 50s after a Korea war era incident involving a aircraft, a U.S. Air Force aircraft. And the family of the pilot who died in the crash brought a suit. The government said there's a state secret implicated here. We can't tell you what happened. The court said, okay, we're going to create this doctrine. It says the executive branch can keep something secret if that's what's needed to protect national security. Fast forward 25 years, the facts come out. It was a total hoax. There was no national security secrets implicated at all. And the only reason the Air Force didn't want to disclose the circumstances of the crash was because it was embarrassing and would have led to legal liability. That's the root of the doctrine. It has since been used to keep secret everything from the National Security Agency's mass surveillance, co-opting the internet as a tool for global surveillance, the CIA's torture of detainees. We're gonna get into all that in a minute. Uh, and this case is about the FBI's infiltration of mosques across the United States under the Bush administration. The Fazaga case is interesting because you remember when we were maybe 10 minutes ago talking about Dr. King and the experience that he endured at the hands of COINTELPRO, I might have neglected to mention at the time, among the things that the Bureau did was uh, surveil him, monitor him, capture audio recordings of him in extramarital trysts, and then threaten him with blackmail and encourage him to commit suicide on the threat that the audio tapes proving his infidelity would come out otherwise. So it's not just surveillance, it's surveillance with the purpose of turning screws. In the Fazaga case, there was a former weightlifter who was deployed to mosques across Southern California, LA and San Diego. His name was Craig Monte. The case only moved forward because the Bureau refused to pay him. And he was outraged and sued the FBI with the ACLU to bring forward this fact of him not only infiltrating mosques across Southern California, but his trick was to, there was an audio listening device in his keys. And so he was notorious for losing his keys all the time. So this guy kept forgetting his keys in places and he was just monitoring conversations, including with uh, several uh, women across the different congregations who he sort of like lured into uh, sexual liaison. So it's like almost the inverse fact pattern of King, right? Like weaponizing surreptitious uh, blackmail, basically using surveillance as a pretext. And then as it happens this very day, the House Judiciary Committee is hosting a hearing on the civil rights and discrimination endured by South Asian Muslim uh, and uh, Arab communities over the last 20 years. And I'm just, this last bullet point is a reference to a documentary. I briefly appear at the end. The reason I recommended it is the, as far as I know, the only depiction of an FBI sting operation from both sides of the investigation. So the filmmakers remarkably got an FBI informant to explain to them what he was doing at the same time that they independently gained access to the target of the investigation. So you can see the sting op operation unfold from both sides of it. And it is absolutely disturbing. And I would encourage everybody to watch it because you will never look at the FBI the same way. And I'd encourage you particularly when you watch terror, reflect on what Dr. King experienced and you will see a bizarre continuity, bizarre not only in the, the continuation exists, but particularly that it is not the object of widespread recognition. You might find yourself troubled by the fact that no one recognizes that the FBI's COINTELPRO pattern remains alive and well in 2022, especially when there have been any number of points at which, and I'm thinking now of every, more or less every prosecution of a domestic Muslim so-called terrorist has fit this pattern of FBI agents and informants exchanging money to propose plots to entrap people in communities to then justify the Bureau's expansion of its powers and its expanding budget allocation. And this is a pattern that goes all the way back to COINTELPRO. 
I want to focus on 2013 particularly for a couple of reasons. One, it was an especially pivotal year as it relates to the national security state. I had a front row seat to some of this. I was leading a national civil rights organization at the time. It was called the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. And in just a couple of months, some very remarkable things happened. This saga is going to connect different branches of the government. And it's a saga of transparency and still lacking accountability that we continue to see today. So February 2013, the Supreme Court decides in a case, Clapper versus Amnesty International, that what you cannot prove the government is doing to you is something that you cannot challenge in court. This was a bunch of lawyers and journalists who went to the court, said the NSA is monitoring us and our clients and our communications. The court said, can you prove it? They said, no. They said, get out of here. We're not here. So it sort of stood for the proposition that secrecy insulates whatever abuse might hide behind the veil. Incredibly disturbing decision. When you consider the role of courts in a democratic society, the Federalist Papers made clear that the crust on which liberty rests when the courts abdicate their role, like they did when they announced the state secrets privilege, or in every case ever applying it, or certainly in Clapper versus Amnesty, we all have a problem. That's not just the courts writing themselves out of the equation. By taking themselves out of the way, the courts expose the rest of us to whatever is prompting those lawsuits to begin in the first place. In the case of Clapper versus Amnesty, we found out soon enough what that was. A month after that court case in the Senate, the Intelligence Committee, there was a unclassified hearing with the Director of National Intelligence, his name was James Clapper. Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon asked him, is the NSA monitoring millions of Americans? And Clapper says under oath, no, sir, not winningly. I had the opportunity to ask Director Clapper three years later, two years later about this exchange. At the conclusion of another Senate hearing, I was writing an article for it for asking him the question, how he evaded perjury for this statement when at the time I asked him the question, Eric Garner in New York had just been killed on the suspicion of selling loose cigarettes. He was the first I can't breathe incident that went viral. Incidentally, hundreds of millions of people have watched the videotape of his murder and the only person who went to jail was the person who took the video. That's, that's the situation with Eric Garner. So I asked Director Clapper about it. How do you justify never facing a charge for perjury when Eric Garner was killed in the street on the suspicion of selling loose cigarettes when you lied to the Senate under oath? I walked out of the room in handcuffs and he still has a pension. So like, this is just like layers upon layers of corruption here. So two months, uh, three months after this exchange in the Senate, a whistleblower at the time, 29 years old, comes forward and through a pretty elaborate cloak and dagger saga brings to the world this evidence that Clapper was lying through his teeth, that the court was incredibly charitable and presumptuous in deferring to the government and that the internet is in fact being co-opted and the telephone system as tools for global surveillance. Around the same time, we are that, so Snowden is releasing in 2013 documents dating back to the Bush administration and going through Obama, uh, we took some folks. This is another element of the history that we have to grapple with. I wanna particularly invite you to think about this in the context of the contemporary discussion about Ukraine, which we're gonna come back to. In 2001, Bush authorizes enhanced interrogation techniques at black sites around the world. These are not public facilities. There's no civilian oversight. There was a scandal when they were even discovered many years later. Obama ends the practice in a way but he ends up not pursuing executive accountability. And I want to just take a minute here to unpack the Nuremberg precedent. So this takes us back to Eisenhower. Remember the president who won the Second World War? At the end of the Second World War, we sent a Supreme Court justice to prosecute the war crimes tribunals at Nuremberg. And the cr critical principle that emerged from those tribunals was strict liability for torture. Strict liability means that there is not a defense. It's not a negligent standard where you can say, well, you know, I took some precaution or somebody told me I could do it or I thought there was an emergency. None of those are defenses under international law for the human rights abuse of torture. If you torture someone or you enable it or you have any hand in it, you are guilty of an international crime. We fought a world war to establish that precedent and we lost it to ourselves without firing a shot because Washington was too timid to apply the same standard that we fought a world war to establish against US officials and personnel who violated. And 
It maps very neatly to the recurring case of murder with impunity by police. And it entails further scales because now we are talking about international harms, right? Now, I haven't even gotten into how torture invites bad intelligence and how it places US service members at greater risk if they're detained, how it undermines our own country's legitimacy to guard human rights in the future. I wanna say that again, when we did all this, it rendered us and any pretense that the United States might care about human rights, a farce. So in other parts of the world where countries are abusing human rights and people might look to the US to provide a counterpoint, we cannot credibly claim to do so in light of the documented history that no one in Washington wants to acknowledge. And this is a critical piece to recognize because you cannot, I mean, everybody knows the adage about repeating history if you don't learn from it, right? Like that's happening as we speak. And this is the history that people forget when they clamor for US intervention in other places. I wanna briefly shout out Diane Feinstein. I'm no fan of her generally. This is the one time I saw her show up for work and she did so in a pretty real way. Senior US Senator from San Francisco. Let's do this another way. We have an incredibly heavy footprint, this city in Washington, DC. San Francisco is a city of under a million people. And we sent to Washington, the vice president of the United States, the second in command of one branch of the government, the speaker of the house who basically unilaterally controls another one, a senior US Senator, and incidentally, the governor of California, Sacramento. Diane Feinstein is the least powerful of all these people. And she, as the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, that was the same committee that exposed COINTELPRO 60 years ago. It was birthed from that committee. The, the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees exist because the last time Congress looked, they caught the agencies doing all kinds of things to people. And they were like, someone's got to mind the store here. So they created committees that have since largely been co-opted. But in 2014, Dianne Feinstein took to the Senate floor, this is under the Obama administration, pre-Trump, to talk about a constitutional crisis. The CIA had hacked the Senate to steal documents that the Senate had collected, proving the CIA's criminal trail in the context of detaining torture. And then the CIA started threatening Senate investigators with prosecution by the Justice Department, the Justice Department's running around saying, we're not doing the CIA's dirty business wars. This US Senator had to get on the Senate floor to say the CIA is conducting cyber espionage operations against the people's representatives in Congress. It's that bad, y'all. This was 2014, okay? We haven't even gotten to Trump yet. So Obama also pioneered an entire new mode of human rights abuses in the form of remote robotic assassination. Now, I happened to live with a senior DOD official in, who was in the Obama administration in Washington in the second term. And the claim in the administration was that these are targeted strikes. It's better than carpet bombing. What do you want us to do, bomb the whole countryside? This is better, right? If it's a targeted strike, no Americans at risk. And the claims that the strikes were targeted flew in the face, yet again, like any number of other things we've seen, of the actual evidence. Independent studies ultimately documented that the drone strikes that the CIA was committing, 90% of the people who were dying were unintended. How targeted is it if only 10% of the deaths are actually intended? If 90% if of the casualties are collateral, can we seriously claim that it's that targeted? And what might that mean about hearts and minds? When, when we left Afghanistan last year and a lot of people were surprised at the reception of the country to the withdrawal, this might have explained a little bit why between torturing people to death and randomly bombing villages across the country for decades, it really should not have surprised anyone what the attitudes were towards the United States, especially given the history before that with the Russian and the imperial invaders before that. During the Obama administration, he and Attorney General at the time, Eric Holder, they announced certain limiting principles. For instance, drone strikes that were going to target US citizens, they said, had to have some sort of relationship to an imminent attack. And there, there were other limited principles, but the point here is that there was no mechanism to enforce them. There's no court that addresses the limiting principles. This was, this was Holder saying, these are the factors we consider in the executive branch when we decide whether to vaporize someone. And there's no one to hold us accountable. We're just going to think about these things and we'll tell you what happens. That, that was the position of the Obama administration. And every Tuesday they had a meeting where the president chose who was going to live and who was going to die. 
which is profoundly antithetical to a system of checks and balances in the constitutional vision, particularly that puts the judiciary between the executive branch and the rest of the world, right? In the same way that the courts with the state secrets doctrine write themselves out of the equation, the history of drone strikes is the executive branch shouldering the judiciary out of the equation. And so recognize these sort of patterns as they reciprocate across different uh, branches. I wanna particularly just note there was a particular drone, uh, two drone strikes, one that killed a US citizen by the name of Anwar al -Awaki. It's fairly uncontested that he was an enemy of the United States, but he was a US citizen who was never accused of picking up a weapon, but he was a propagandist or terrorist, and so that made him a threat. So what do you call it when the US government is vaporizing citizens based on their speech, or better yet, his 16-year-old kid who was born in the United States and nobody ever alleged had any involvement in anything, who was killed in a separate drone strike? that the government claimed was an act. While their family is in federal court trying to get a hearing to keep them from being assassinated. <laughs> I would love for someone to make that make sense to me as a lawyer. Yeah, part of the reason I do the work I do is that I pay too much attention and like whatever fabrications are contrived to make this stuff make sense. They just don't hold any water. Uh, again, another part of the reason why I'm doing what I do today. I should note that these statistics on the right are under-inclusive uh, these were the ones that were reported at the time, and as we've discovered in a number of instances, <laughs> we can't always rely on the statistics that are supplied by agencies that are holding themselves. Thank you. Okay, so now people started to worry about fascism. After all that happened, when under bipartisan legislation, concentration camps were funded at our nation's borders, then people started to worry about fascism. After paramilitary squads were deployed to US cities, immune from civilian local oversight to suppress local dissent. This is in a country with a first amendment, mind you, okay? And, and the, the goon squads deployed to Kenosha and Portland, they were funded by bipartisan agreements ever since the creation of DHS in 2003. So this is not a partisan issue. These are subjects ultimately of bipartisan consensus. I was among the many people who've been attacked by people driving cars into rallies. Uh, the person who hit me was a hedge fund lawyer in Washington who I took to court. Uh, this is a great story. The jury found that he hit me. And after a screaming match that we could hear through the walls of the courtroom, they came back and uh, they said that they found that he lied about not hitting me. They said that he hit me and they gave me zero dollars in damage. And this was before changes to laws in states around the country to formally insulate people using vehicular assault as a way to infringe the First Amendment rights of their neighbors. It's a little bit of a gloss because to infringe a First Amendment right, frankly, takes state action and this is more like vigilante violence. But the idea of people keeping their neighbors silent through threats of violence is the key no longer out there. Remember, <clears throat> are people familiar with the role of the brown shirts? in Central Europe in the 30s. This is sort of, um, think, think about the brown shirts or you know, people who drive cars in protests as uh, civilian paramilitary vigilantes. Right-wing reactionaries might be the way that you describe them if you were writing an article about a country in Latin America without, you know, of course, recognizing that we have plenty of them here. Now we talked before about Coco Intel Pro 1.0. That was like the era that tried to drive Dr. King to an early suicide or the assassination of Fred Hampton in Chicago. We talked about COINTELPRO 2.0, which was the infiltration of mosques around the country. COINTELPRO 3.0 unfolded under Trump. There was an attempt by the Justice Department to get the personal identification, personally identifying information of over a million people who had visited a website planning protests about Trump's inauguration. So this idea that just visiting a website would make you a potential object of interest to the government was a very novel proposition. Thankfully, this is one of the places where the court showed up for work and limited the scale of the warrant. But I'm flagging that so you can see what the executive branch is going for and how bad it could get if left unrestrained. And of course, we all remember that at the end of that administration it was the end of the history of the peaceful transition of power between administrations, which had been a constant since the birth of the Republic. And it is worth recognizing just how much 
There's an ancient Chinese proverb or a curse, I should say, about living in interesting times. We are living in the kinds of interesting times that were wished upon people as curses in previous eras, and you should recognize the fluidity of the system that is in rapid flux. Yeah, a lot of these norms that have stood for a very long time are shaking, and there's a, a great deal of instability, both crisis and potential opportunity. Okay, um, we're gonna, is there a clock? I just wanna check. Great, okay. All right, so, I want to particularly make the point here about how attacks on immigrant rights presage and enable attacks on the rights of other Americans who are not necessarily immigrants. As an immigrant, I've come to recognize that most people don't necessarily give a damn about us, but I would invite you to recognize how attacks on our rights eventually, inevitably implicate your own. So family separations are a thing that, to this point, you might think of as uniquely born by immigrants, except map that to the experience of every person who has a parent who ends up incarcerated. Right? Like these are again situations that have domestic parallels. Hearings and mass are at least a unique situation in the international asylum context. These are basically denials of due process where instead of someone getting an individuated court hearing, they're lumped in with others, often in court proceedings using languages they don't understand, profound abdications of due process. This next story secure communities. Does anybody remember this? I don't know if anybody here might be from. A community where this would have been controversial. So the Secure Communities Initiative was an Obama era doctrine, or not a doctrine, a program presented to the public as an ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement Program, to facilitate the deportation of people with criminal records. So the idea was they fingerprint everybody who got booked for a criminal offense. If you didn't show up in the right database, you'd be fast tracked for deportation. Now, the problem with that approach is when you're taking fingerprints from everybody arrested, you're not confining the collection to immigrants. Everybody booked for a criminal offense was included in this biometric collection scheme, which it turned out after a bunch of nonprofit groups sued the government, it turned out it was an FBI program the whole time and it was never about deporting immigrants. The whole thing was about creating a biometric surveillance system. And they used immigrants as the bait to get this system created. And as we speak, the Next Generation Initiative, FBI program has half a billion biometric records in it. They co-opted the photos from departments of motor vehicles. That's how they built the facial recognition system, the fingerprint repositories of police departments around the country. And they did all this without a legislative mandate, actively hiding the ball from the public. So now we have a national biometric surveillance team. And you can thank the demagoguery targeting immigrants for it. Similar problem, still not recognized uh, widely. There's a group outside San Diego called Al Ultra Lado. They do uh, asylum support and defense for the communities that were detained in mass at our nation's southern border in particular. There are US citizens who are currently on State Department lists not allowed to leave the country because the Mexican government at the State Department's invitation has identified them as human rights defenders. And so the US government is blocking US citizens who work with migrants as aid workers from leaving the country to work in the camps on the other side. What kind of countries deny their citizens the right to leave based on their speech? Does that sound like a land of the free or a home of the brave to you? And those are not immigrants I'm talking about. Those are people whose rights are being restrained because of our nation's primary commitment to restraining immigration. And the human, I mean, there's a whole other layer of perversity here in that. Uh, so are people familiar with the climate crisis and the drought across Central America? Many of the people who are piling up at our nation's borders in the mass camps are climate refugees. Refugees, not just from the climate crisis, but also the destabilization of governments that we've had a particular hand in specifically related to the drug war and the DEA's sort of extraterritorial enforcement efforts. So the point is, we are driving the conflict here. And in not dissimilar way that we have driven conflict in many other places, including Eastern Europe, and then lamenting the predictable result. Uh, you know, here we're just talking about the assaults on the rights of Americans. I, you know, I'm, this last piece when I talk about the right to migrate and flee climate crisis or flee orchestrated violence in the community, those are some of the international arms that, that go even more widely over the country. I want to just take this moment to recognize how many of these programs enjoy bipartisan consensus. 
These are not objects of political controversy at all because Democrats and Republicans agree on mass incarceration. The Biden administration agrees on detaining migrants in mass. He's defending Title 42 in federal court right now. Mass surveillance, not just by the NSA, but we found out recently the CIA is also involved in domestic mass surveillance using an executive order 1233 illegally or unconstitutionally. We spent more money on the military, even in times of relative peace, than we do on anything else in the federal budget. That's what your tax dollars go to. And that is an object of thoroughly bipartisan consensus. Remember, Eisenhower declared a military industrial congressional complex. That's what he was talking about. Executive secrecy is an interesting one to dive into here. I don't want to go too deep on this, but just to take a minute on the prosecution of Julian Assange, is anybody here familiar with it? Is anybody not? Raise your hand if Julian Assange is not in the news. Okay, I'm glad we're here. Julian Assange is an Australian publisher. He founded an organization called WikiLeaks. Like a lot of publications, they end up pissing off a lot of people because their work calls out power. Unfortunately for them, on both sides of the partisan aisle. At one point, what WikiLeaks revealed with the help of a military whistleblower by the name of Chelsea Banning was the collateral murder video. Feel, if you're taking notes, write down collateral murder and check out the video. This was a video revealed by WikiLeaks showing a US military assassination of two Reuters journalists and an ensuing cover up. That's why Assange has been prosecuted under administrations led by both Republicans and Democrats. It's the first time in US history that we've ever prosecuted a publisher for publishing evidence of US war crimes. If the prosecution is successful, it will stand for the proposition that the government not only has the right to commit crimes, but the right to cover them up. And if anybody attempts to reveal them, that that is criminal. It is incredibly dystopian. And it would serve as a force multiplier for all of these other vectors of corruption because it would enable the executive secrecy that, that allows them to persist. We talked before about the CIA torturing some folks. I didn't say at the time that the agencies currently led, Gina Haspel is her name, by the figure who was responsible for destroying the videotaped evidence that Diane Feinstein then came forward to decry a constitutional crisis when the CIA stole it back after the Senate got its hands on it. So the impunity is so bad that the architects of human rights abuses get promoted. Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court Justice, people might remember him. Brett Kavanaugh was a torture lawyer in the Bush administration. And it's so bad that when he was nominated, we couldn't get any traction on his work approving torture because everybody was more concerned about, I mean, there were frankly many reasons to be concerned about it in his record, but you know, somehow that one was not one that people were that concerned about. And when you think about the division of power between the, the executive, the judiciary, and the congressional branches, the Federalist Papers, the founders were explicit, they wanted them to fight each other, yes? They're, they're meant to be adversarial towards one another in order for we, the people, to not get fleeced by all of them together. When you see this uh, pattern across the different branches of colluding to undermine we have, we have a problem. And the last thing I'm just gonna note here, we'll come back to that, is the extraterritorial extension of our interests. We don't have a Department of War anymore. We have a Department of Defense. Why is the Department of Defense for the United States engaged from Iraq to Afghanistan to Colombia to Eastern Europe? Is it, is it the United States we are defending or something else? Interests well beyond our borders. And that is the object of bipartisan unspoken consensus. And because it's an unspoken consensus, there's no debate about it. You never hear about it. It is absolutely critical to be independent, to look at objects of unstated consensus, to examine them. In background consensus often lurks profound bias, and it's easy to overlook if you don't look at it carefully. And when I say look at it carefully, I mean to say look at it and juxtapose it with similar examples. We'll do that again in a minute. It's kind of yeah. Okay, great. I'll, I'll wrap up the question. Uh, I don't want to go too hard on this. I'll say that there's a primary in Texas today as we speak, pitting Jessica Cisneros against Henry Cuellar. He is one of many Democrats who oppose the rights of women to have control over their bodies. Reproductive liberty is the most fundamental example of bodily autonomy. The state has no legitimate basis to intervene here, yet there are Democrats 
who agree with their right-wing colleagues on reproductive authoritarianism. If we're talking about authoritarianism, reproductive authoritarianism is one of the most pernicious personal examples of it. And then there's a lot of stake here, right? If the corporate corruption that the military industrial complex represents has long threatened everything from a climate catastrophe to, as we speak today, potential war with the nuclear power. And the ultimate question before us is, do we want democratic control over these decisions? And I don't mean democratic like Democratic Party, but a democratic process that includes all of us. Or do we want capital to make decisions for all of us? The climate crisis is the result of allowing capital and the inertia that it forces to run us off of a cliff. As long as we allow corporate resource extraction and private gains for resource plunder, we can we know what's coming next, right? And, and so one of my particular goals here to the extent I have an opportunity to make policy is nationalizing the fossil fuel sector so that we, the people, get to decide how high the dial is turning. There's no reason capitalism turns the dial up to 10. It's whoever can make a buck off it, it'll go forward. But there's no reason to treat limited resources like that, especially in an era of the externalities we all know about, the military industrial complex and its sustained corruptions have been the forces pressure from the other side. Um, I'll share the slides with people so you can see some of this later, but just to run through this corruption embodying and entrenching the military industrial complex is a problem. These are a few steps I'd like to pursue to help address it. Banning expressions of cyber trading, prohibiting formal policy makers from representing corporate clients, ending judicial life tenure is widely overlooked. I could tell a whole story about campaign finance reform. You know, catch me outside, we can talk about it. Requiring debates is one I would really love to see. I happen to be running for Congress against someone who's ducked debates for 34 years. And the idea that we have any meaningful democracy when incumbents refuse to show up and defend their ideas in public does test credulity. Let's say that. A bunch of things here we could get into. There's a controversy about congressional insider trading. Take a picture of the slide if you want. I don't think we have time to dig into it now, but these are a bunch of questions that even after the controversy has finally emerged, a long overdue one, still are not getting answered. This is worth just spending a second on. War drums are beating very loudly in Washington right now. We've all been here before. The first piece here that people forget is that this war did not start this year. Eight years ago, there was a coup in Ukraine. The Pentagon had a hand in it. It played a crucial role in instigating the current crisis. To pretend that that didn't happen would insinuate a legitimate role for us where I suspect we might not have one, especially given this history that we've discussed. Right? The Cuban Missile Crisis was an almost precisely analogous instance where analogous to the US putting effectively a proxy power on Russia's border, Russia 60 years ago tried to do the same thing with us. And there was a result there that if it were to be consistent today would look something like the US committing not to expand NATO to Russia's doorstep. And this is ultimately what we have to revisit at the Truman Doctrine, this presumption that we in any way have any entitlement to police the globe rests on no justification at all. It flies in the face of every conceivable piece of evidence. And if anybody's concerned about human rights in Ukraine, which I absolutely am as well, I would just ask you to care at least half as much about human rights in Yemen or Palestine or Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam. I could go on Laos or Cambodia for that matter. It's, it's you know, we could recite the names of countries all day that the US has intervened without a slightest care for human rights. So the idea that we have any legitimacy to do so today, test fertility. I had an exchange with Professor Said just before we started about the United Nations, which I understand you study and I'm grateful for that. If there is a legitimate body to intervene, it would be the UN. Two reasons it's constrained. One, structurally, the Security Council, which uh, is responsible for many of the UN's actions, so not all of them. It's structurally co-opted because member states have veto rights. So because the US and Russia both sit on the Security Council, it's sort of hamstrung structurally. Short of that, it is striking to me that the US is multiple billions of dollars in arrears to the UN. Congress just gave the Pentagon $25 billion more than Biden requested, but we can't even pay our member dues to the UN while we run around invading countries, you know, despite its uh, principles. And I, I think this, this 
idea of investing authority in multilateral institutions is the way for us to actually be helpful rather than simply imperial in our serial interventions. Anything else there? Okay, these are some things I would like to see happen, ways that we could legitimately help respond in the Ukraine. One is humanitarian aid. Re accepting refugees and asylum seekers would be a great step forward, and people might think that's, uncon that's uncontroversial, except we have thousands of asylum seekers currently detained in mass at our nation's borders. So as long as we're worried about the new wave, can we deal with the one that's been there for a while? There's no principal justification between asylum seekers or refugees from Ukraine versus those from Central America. And if we just accepted our own principles that we fought world's wars to establish, we might be in a better place for some of this. Brokering a ceasefire under a multilateral IGO like the UN, that would be a sustainable, legitimate path forward and committing NATO not to extend it into the nuclear. nuclear disarmament is a long-term goal is a thing I think we all want to see. Note that none of these things are unilateral US initiatives. And every voice you hear in Washington is clamoring for Washington to do something. And I would just invite you again to think about the things we've talked about today to see, is Washington entitled to do anything at all? I think that gets us close to the, is that the, yeah, great. So these are some things you can do. I don't want this to just be doom and gloom. I'm, I'm trying to acquaint you with a crisis, but you're not just passive actors. You're actually hyper-empowered, even if you might not feel like it, and that you have a unique privilege at the moment of studying. You get to actually spend time to peel the stuff apart in a way that most people don't. And you might feel busy now. If the most depressing thing I might tell you today is that that's only gonna get worse. Uh, and it really will, honestly, like if that's, you might feel busy now, but like you have more control over your time at the moment than you ever will in your life. And you have more opportunities to learn than, than many of you will continue to have opportunities to learn. There are always opportunities to learn, but take advantage of the one you have, focus your scholarship, take your learning beyond the classroom into the community. You can redeploy your privilege strategically on behalf of those who don't have it. The first step there is just recognizing it in the first place, examine, figure out what your privileges are and how you can deploy them. Taking action in community, think global, act local. Please reach out if you have any questions or need ideas. I and my team would be uh, excited to work with you and I'm grateful for you being here. The last slide is just a thank you. But thank you so much for, for joining us today. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I know some of you are introduction to sociology students. You're most welcome to stay behind and converse the chat for those who need to go to classes. You can, but we will be taking some QA because we have the room, and I know my English is good.